Thank you. I'm Johnny Depp. No, uh, I, uh, it's great. It's a, a wonderful night. Thank you all for coming to this little intimate dialogue we're going to have. And I'm very excited. Uh, and it's going to be a wonderful night. And you are going to be amazed. And uh, I want to I wanna say what the context of why we're doing this. Uh, the Origins Project this weekend is running a workshop where we have 20 of the, of the world's greatest scientists in neuroscience and artificial intelligence, and many of them in the audience today, uh, have been meeting for the last two days talking about pattern processing in the human mind in, its con in the context of, of intelligence, learning, but also in machine brains. And the idea is to look at how important pattern processing is in terms of allowing us to, to model the world and to understand how the brain works. And when it goes wrong, when pattern processing goes wrong, you get schizophrenia and things like that, and to explore how we can understand that, and hopefully how we can make machines that aren't schizophrenic, especially when they're intelligent and, um, and controlling nuclear weapons. But uh, so when we thought about doing that, with origins, we always like to connect as much as possible science and culture. And, um, and the, the relationship between madness and creativity, the connections, the pattern processing that we discussed in the meeting, we thought of trying to connect that in the real world. And it was clear that we couldn't do it better. The most appropriate individual in the world to, to connect those was the individual who's going to come out in a little bit today. Because he's the most, he's most capable, as you'll see, of intelligently connecting those two things in almost every aspect of his life. Johnny Depp is without a doubt, one of the world's greatest actors. Well, there he is. And he's, but the hallmark of his career, one of the hallmarks that's really important is, the, is his, his choice of characters, their eccentricity, marginalized people, troubled people, otherwise kind of odd, but often profoundly creative. And what he's done, and what is the beauty of his acting, is that they're not two-dimensional. He makes them three-dimensional beings. And, 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 and indeed, as we put in the, in the title of this event tonight, he finds the creativity in madness. Most, many of you may not know that, of course, besides being an actor, he's an incredibly talented musician, also a writer, and also an artist. So he embraces creativity in all aspects of the human sphere, and then tries to bring it onto the screen in the context of madness. And the other thing, so he's kind of cute, but uh, the, the, uh, but you're going to see he's more than a pretty face because what we're not going to have one man up here today. We're going to have at least 60 of them. And 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 here, if you if we zoom in, you'll you'll see that there's a man who's involved in over 70 films with many different characters. Pretty neat, eh? I'm very impressed that we did this. But uh, but but there may be. There may be one or two of you who haven't seen a film, so we created a little, a little clip to introduce you to the many characters and the many people that are Johnny Depp. So if we could run that right now. We, uh, we couldn't let Donald Trump have the last picture, so, <laughs> so we thought we'd give Jack Sparrow the last word in this introduction. So let's go to the last little, little uh, clip here. That's, we thought, set the page. So um, without further ado, I'd like to bring out one of the most inventive, thoughtful, generous, kind, interesting, caring people I've ever known. Someone I'm extremely proud to call my friend and admire tremendously. Johnny Depp.
<laughs> Go ahead. It's fine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are um, we related, all of us? Are you relatives? That's, is that why you clap? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Uh, this is the first time I'm going to call him Professor Krauss because he doesn't like it when I call him Professor Krauss. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Krauss. Yeah, I like to be called Hair Doctor Professor Krauss. Hair Doctor <laughs> Professor Krauss. Um, so we, you were telling me about interviews you've done, so I thought we'd start. What's your favorite color? No, I'm not. <laughs> um, uh. so, okay, so let's, I want to start, I want to cover a lot of material, but I want to start with your background, of course, which is from Kentucky, right? Yeah. From um, the backwoods of Kentucky? Yeah. I was born, uh, I was born in Owensboro, Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky is, in a weird way, the kind of uh, navel. <laughs> of the U.S., and I mean that in the best way possible. Navels are important. Um, so my 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 upbringing was uh, very, very interesting, and um, it was a rough uh, upbringing. I have a strange upbringing. It was uh, most times quite unpleasant. <laughs> you had an uncle who was a preacher, right? I had an uncle who was a preacher. Uh, my mom, my mom, my dad never really had uh, anything that you could uh, call religion, you know. But I had an uncle who was a preacher, my uncle Denny, and uh, you know they they we'd have to go watch him preach on Sunday, and uh, you know I, I knew the guy, you know, he's my uncle, so I, I watched him very closely and. And um, he had that beautiful kind of evangelical cadence that, that draws you in. And then it's, you know, maybe I'm six, seven years old, and suddenly you see grown-ups, adults, you know, throwing their hands up into the air, uh, screaming, I'm saved, running up and grabbing his ankle and kissing his shoe and speaking in tongues and all that stuff. And it was at that... Oh, those are killer yeah, stomps, yeah, yeah, by yeah. the way. <laughs> anyway, sorry, go on. I might kiss that shoe before the end of the night. <laughs> it's there. Um, so, so, for, so for me, to see, to see that, you know, and it was, it was... I mean, it was intense, you know. And again, like, I knew the guy. He carried a, he carried a lead pipe and his... Uh, in his golden Cadillac with a TV in it, um, to stomp, to, to, you all, to stove people's heads in if he had to. <laughs> so I could see the, the, the two sides of the man. So at, at that ripe old age of six or seven years old, I realized, this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there, huh? <laughs> You see, yeah, I think you, you, it's a lie. You, yeah, you see, we kind of agree on a few things. Yeah, um, but you know, when I know that it was a difficult childhood, and we'll, we'll get to some of the aspects of that in a sense. But school certainly was too. But when did you first realize you were really strange? <laughs> um, pretty early on. Um, well, it's one of those things we all feel. You know, you're either you know going through school, you're either an insider or you're an outsider, or whatever. Um, I, I never wanted to be... I definitely never wanted to be inside, because I found those people pretty boring and pretty monotonous, and uh, uh, they thought about things like, you know, obsessed on sports scores and things like that. So, so I, I didn't, never considered myself outside. I just didn't consider myself inside. So I just sort of did what I did. So I reckon it was probably around the age of, uh, yeah, probably nine or ten, when, um, let's say, uh, the circus kicked in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you lasted a while. You lasted for until you were 15 before you left school, right? Yeah, and it was tough. Yeah, but you know, I know you weren't a good, you weren't long. a stellar student. But there was a book. You were telling me, I think, there's a book that, that when you were thinking about yourself, that impacted on you. Well, you get to a point, you know, uh, uh, you know if, you're, if, you, if, if you're feeling pretty strange uh, from the age of nine to the age of 15, you know, we think of that in terms of six years, and it 
it's a it's a bird song. But six years at that point in your life is quite a long period to mull over uh, uh, that you're potentially insane and you're going to end up in a bug house. <laughs> you know. So I had this brilliant idea. I wouldn't read a thing that they gave me in school. I just wouldn't. I, I, I just, I just wouldn't because I had teachers. I'd, I just never felt they were particularly interested in teaching. They never gave me the feeling that they wanted to teach me anything. It was sort of a by numbers, by the numbers. So um, I searched out a book in a library, and it was called Abnormal Psychology and Modern Life. And I read it cover to cover to try to, I don't know, I suppose diagnose myself or whatever. Uh, worst thing I could have ever done. <laughs> Worst thing I could have ever done, because when I finished that book, I realized I was screwed. <laughs> okay, and then, no be, and then you, but then you, you didn't, you didn't go and become an actor. You know what? Didn't we agree we'd take these off so that people could see your beautiful face? Oh, oh. there we go. Okay. I had to. I mean, okay. I wouldn't say beautiful is the. Uh, I, I don't know. I think there's some people who disagree with you. I, most people are looking at me, so they probably don't even notice you. But it's. Um, I agree. They. Uh, that's what I'd be. That's what I'd be doing. <laughs> Plus the red shoes, you know. It's the red shoes. You know, I had to do something. I had to. I knew I have to do something to compete. Um, <laughs> but you, you went and and you went. You be, to play music when you quit school. You didn't go to become an actor. Well, I'd, I'd already, I was already, I started playing the guitar at the age of 12. I felt a, 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 a passion for it that, uh, yeah, it was the first real passion that I, that I, that I had. And I, and I can safely say because I feel, and I felt then that the word ambition has become dirty, you know? Yeah. Because ambition somehow implies that the result, I know. <laughs> I know. I know. Cry. <laughs> I'll, I'll probably be crying in about 10 minutes. So. Um, so ambition was a dirty word to me because it felt like you were working for some gain or material or some status. Or, so I literally don't remember going through puberty. Uh, uh, because I locked myself in a room at the age of 12, 12, 13, and, and just played the guitar, learned things off records, and taught myself how to play. And it was my life. Um, and it was the only solace. It was the only sanctuary. It was the only security. It was, the, it was my first love. Um, now, now, you draw now, too. Did you, did you draw then as well? Did you, have you always been drawing as well? Yeah, I always did. I, from a very, very young age, I, 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 uh, I felt a, a great need to occupy my brain. Um, because otherwise, if I, if I didn't force um, information in there or distract myself from the circus, um, <laughs> that I would go mad. And so I... I you know, I did everything. I dug a tunnel in my backyard that would go into my closet so that I could escape and get in. And, you know, <laughs> true story. My parents weren't particularly happy about it. <laughs> but I was proud. I was proud of it. Um, but, you know, but acting, well, I think we'll get to why acting may have been the perfect outlet for you. But, but what's interesting to me, the other day you were talking to me and we said, that you don't, you know, so you, musician, actor, Artist in that Stuff. sense, but you say you don't consider yourself an artist. No. And you said acting, acting and art are like an oxymoron or something. Well, certainly the term serious actor, <laughs> <laughs> which which you hear a lot. You know, I uh, people say, uh, I uh, no, I, I want to be a serious actor, and you just look at them and go, oh man, oh, man. <laughs> you're missing it. You're missing it. It's all right, read Stanislavski, it's great. Uh, 
Read Eric Morris. It's great. Read, <laughs> uh, you know, read all those books. Read Udo Hagen. Read it. But serious actor, avoid that at all costs. You know, um, I don't think that. In, I think the technicians on a film set, uh, production designer, for example, cinematographer, who 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 is uh, choosing uh, the composition. Um, and, and how that affects the psychology of what the audience feels. I believe that the director uh, sometimes. Uh, <laughs> the crew, uh, those guys are craftsmen and those guys are artists. Um, an actor, I just don't feel that an actor can be an artist. I, I feel, and it's, it's uh, it, it's unfortunate. I wish I, I wish I could. I wish I could think of myself as an artist, but I can't. I just can't. Never could. It, it, uh, it, but but it doesn't mean you can't approach the work uh, with uh, the need or desperation or 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 passion of an artist. I do approach the work in that way. It just. I just refuse to believe that an actor. Uh, I think can you be said once because you knew where you. I mean, we both talked about that. It's hard. I don't think either of us takes ourselves too seriously because we know where we came from, in a sense. And 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 it's hard. You think of yourself as something else. And you just realize that. Come on, that's just a label. I just you know, I, I know exactly. Yeah, I know where I came from. I know exactly where I came from. <laughs> and it's ludicrous that I ended up where I ended up, and I feel very fortunate to have to have met the people that I've met, to have become uh, such as this man here, uh, my, uh, my hero. <laughs> Truly, that's the, first, you know, that's the first thing I said to him when I met him. Hi, I'm Johnny, you're my hero. Um, I knew I liked true. him then. That was true. I said, that's when I knew you were smart and a really good <laughs> No, my my my, you know, my my drug of choice is YouTube. You know, my my <laughs> my wife and I sit there and go through, you know, hours of of, uh, of Lawrence and, and Christopher Hitchens and uh, Richard Dawkins. And, you know, uh, yeah. Now, okay, let's let, enough about me. Let's talk about you. Um, I thought this uh, was for you. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Now, so, uh, by the way, I just want to explain something. This is not my fault. What I'm about to do. This is not a cigarette. This is a, a stage prop. It's a prop. Yeah. And there is a loophole in the law that I learned from my uh, dear friend and a great comedian, Doug Stanhope. Who, uh, oh, good. Doug discovered that smoking on stage is, uh, is kind of a... Yeah, it's a... You know, it's like if Chekhov put a cigarette into a scene. What are you going to do, cut it out? <laughs> it's like Disney wanting to cut out the caterpillars smoking of the... Bomb. <laughs> True story, by the way. Yeah? yeah? True story. <laughs> but we should say, like we say, like I always do when I do demonstrations, we say to the kids, don't do this at home. Right? Oh, yeah, don't do this anywhere. It's stupid. <laughs> it's actually stupid. It really is. It's one of the dumbest things I've ever done in my life, but... Uh... Okay, let's talk about other things. <laughs> um, he knew I was just about to go somewhere else. So, uh, yeah. No, good, good call. So, one of the things, you know, you're, you're, we, you're lucky, because not every actor can control his... I only like it because it's breaking the rules. That's the only reason I like it. Um, but not every actor can control his or her own roles, or what chooses to, and, and chooses to control the roles that they want to do, rather than the roles that would be commercial, you know, that, that would propel them in a certain commercial direction. Indeed. Yeah. And you have chosen to play eccentric or odd characters for the most part, and, but, and, and sort of push the boundaries. And, and I wonder if you want to talk about why, why, why that choice. I've always been drawn to I mean, my whole life, I was, I was drawn to people uh, like, you know, I remember being maybe 14, 15 years old and being 
fascinated with Vincent van Gogh. I, I remember being fascinated with Jack Kerouac and reading On the Road at a very young age and, and reading a book that represented freedom, you know. Uh, I came into, I came, you know, I, I became an actor by mistake. I really did. It just sort of happened. And it, and it happened out of absolute need, need to pay the rent, <laughs> need to live. Um, so for the first couple of years, I really just was doing these movies to because somebody was going to give me money, you know, to do it. And then at a certain point, I realized that I was standing on a different road than my music uh, and playing in a band. So at that point, I became uh, passionate about learning uh, and, and understanding what it really is and what it can be. So in my brain, um, like for example, being, I was on a series called uh, 21 Jump Street. <laughs> but the, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw half of one. <laughs> but I was, on, I, I was on that series, and, 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 I, and I don't mean this to sound like some hideous, uh, you know, whiny actor or anything like that, uh, or, 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 or that I was, you know, in a, that I wanted to bite the hand that fed me, but I felt imprisoned, I felt trapped, because at the time Fox Network was trying to they were building themselves, and they and they and they were shoving me down the throats of, of uh, every you know every the country, and and I felt very uncomfortable, um, because I realized that they'd made me a product, and I, I I did not want to be a product, no matter what, because I could go back to construction, or I could pump gas again, or, you know I could play music, whatever I. So for the three years that I was involved with that show, I did everything I could to be fired. <laughs> I did. I, I did. Uh, you, in, in fact, by appearing to be insane, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I did. I, I showed up on set once in a George Washington wig <laughs> <laughs> with uh, red, white, and blue star-spangled bell-bottom <laughs> pants and refused to take it off because there's a great protection that one can use in terms of your approach to your character. There's a circle around you that no one can come into, which is, this is my choice for the character. <laughs> that makes it a very difficult argument for a, a producer or a, you know, someone of the upper echelon. So, the George Washington wig came out, the turban came out. I began to talk <laughs> like this in one scene, you are under arrest, sir. You know, uh, there was, there was, uh, what was it? oh God, there was a really good one that they freaked out over. Oh, I took a rubber band and I wrapped it around the back of my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> of course they asked, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, well, my, 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 my character has a speech impediment. <laughs> they shut down the set, of course, you know, but, because uh, I wouldn't take it off. But, the, but they still wouldn't fire me. <laughs> I tried everything. But so so I, I felt like I was imprisoned. And, and, and you vowed never to, essentially you vowed exactly. never to be doing that again. And, and that's why exactly. the choice of characters has always gone. And do you think it's because, I was going to talk about this later, but maybe now is a good time, that because, I mean, the more intense the characters, the more strange the characters, the more you had to put yourself into those characters and get out of the rest of your life? And it, it, do you think there's some, some aspect of that? Definitely. I, 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 I knew that I... I felt I had something to offer. You did? I wasn't sure if I was right or wrong, but I knew that I 
had to try, and I knew that that was going to require paving or actually hacking your way through uh, uh, a jungle uh, that would, I needed to pave my own road. Cry Baby, you know, they, they, they'd offered me all kinds of movies where basically, you know, the, the head of my agency said, look, here's what you have to do to, 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 to be successful. You must carry a gun and shoot people. And you have to, uh, you know, uh, 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 do things with girls. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, that's a shame. On camera. <laughs> so when he said that, yeah, I was really worried because I thought, God damn, this guy has no idea what I'm going to try to do, you know? So uh, I waited and waited for a film, and then John Waters offered me Cry Baby, which I thought, Perfect opportunity. Oh, thanks. Long time ago, man. But uh, he offered me Cry Baby, and I thought it was the perfect opportunity to make fun of the image that they had oh. uh, chosen for me. So Cry Baby happened. Did another season on the show. Tried to get fired. <laughs> no luck. Was cast in Edward Scissorhands by Tim. Oh, man. Mm. You know, I want to I want to let these people know something amazing when, when, we, when sometime when we, after we first met. But um, and I think it relates to your attitude towards acting and and the intensity of acting. Um, two things: one, and tonight we're going to force you to do a little bit, although the monitor is only small. You've never seen any of your films ever. I tried to see one once <laughs> because the director asked me to. And my, my wife, Amber, can attest to this because her elbow was very busy that night. I was uh, sitting next to her. Director's wife is here, director's here. I fell asleep 35 times. <laughs> <laughs> and I got this. Maybe. But, Wake up. <laughs> but part of the reason is, is, is being in the moment when you're acting and after. I mean, I, you don't want to... I feel the experience. I'm happy with the process is what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. The process of creating, the process of, of, of exploring, the process of breaking formula, the, the process of dropping the bottom out of a scene because, it, because people can get stale. Yeah. And I feel that's the wrong place to be. So. I'm interested and always have been interested in trying to avoid what was expected. And Edward Scissorhands was certainly the, the first real opportunity for me to feel like I was uh, standing on firm ground. Cry Baby was important. Edward Scissorhands was, was the first time that I felt, okay, I, I'm, 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 I'm solid. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to. I we're can gonna... start hacking through, and, you know, paving my way. <laughs> I want to get to Edward Scissorhands in a bit, but but I want to take some time to get there because I want. Sure. There's another thing you told me, which I think is particularly telling, which is that you read a script and then and then you never after. You, I know that you you uh, improvise a lot of, of lines in your scripts, but mm -hmm. but that you never read the screen directions after the first time you read it. You never read never. what the character is supposed to do. And, and, I, and I, I think I understand that now, but, but why, why don't you talk about it a little bit? Well, when, you, when I read a script, what happens to me? Uh, uh, are you guys bored shitless? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they don't. He, 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 here's, the pure, here's, the, here's pure madness and creativity. He was very creative and very brave to invite me up here to, to, yeah. to do this. I'm fucking mad. <laughs> for accepting such a wonderful offer. Um, I, I told I was gonna, I might say it, but it's self-serving, but I'm gonna say it anyway. So I got to act in a, in a movie. I just did a movie with Werner Herzog, and, and uh, it'll come out later this year, Werner where I played Herzog. a villain, and for the first I time. And so, um, and, uh, but, but the process, by not reading the screen directions, it seems to me what the real, that means you actually have to think about, instead of being told what the character is supposed to do, mm -hmm. 
which sort of takes the reality out of it. You have to think about what you're saying and then do it. And I, and I can really understand that. Well, the thing is, it's... I mean, with, with the work, with the process, which is my... It's the only thing I'm interested in, is being in the trenches in terms of film, which is, which is a... I don't care what anybody says, it's a collaborative effort. Everyone, the real, like I said, the real artists are those people, the focus puller, the operator, the DP. When I'm in that process, I'm free. As a character, I can do anything in the world. I have no shame, clearly. <laughs> I can do anything as a character, as myself. Um, and do, do you think you need I that? I crumble. Do you think you need that, that freedom that you get as a character? Oh, I, I definitely need it. Good, because I, mean, I, I want to show a clip. Um, uh -oh. um, I'll just keep my head this down. Is, this is, oh, it's behind me, I don't have to. No, I think this is, because it's interesting when, I, when you play a character that I think expresses what you were saying, and, and I don't know, there's a movie called The Libertine that you did, and, um, and there's a clip I want to show from that, which I think that character Need, needed that, and, 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 and we'll talk about how you related to that character mm. and why you did it. So let's watch a clip. You can avert your eyes. I will. So, okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Thank you. We're gonna we're gonna torch you a lot tonight. It's so, gonna be so good. But, but no, but I think are, that I mean it's a beautiful. Well, well, actually, I have another <laughs> clip from that later, but it, it's an amazing role. But Thank you. But it, 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 it <laughs> sorry, but it, it, uh, it expressed, it, it, you really, you chose to do that character, and I think you related to that character in many different ways, which we'll talk about, but, in, but, far but, too many but the need, the, the, in some sense, the need as, as someone who's troubled in real life, perhaps, to be able to, to be able to go to the theater and be able to express that creativity and that freedom that allows you to be whatever you want and not be called crazy. Well, that's the key is be, to be. Being is mostly reacting. It's not acting, necessarily. It's, it's the ability to be. It's the ability to accept whatever comes at you. To react, are you to telling react. me? To react, yeah. Um, and to apply truths, your own truths, um, to various uh, moments. And one of the reasons why I don't read screen direction, um, I go through a screenplay and I, and I, it's the Kerouac sort of thing. It's uh, first thought, best thought. So I allow myself to, to just scratch out could dialogue, anything. Um, but screen direction I don't think much of, only in the sense that I don't want to know what they want me to do. I, I'd like to find it because, the it, because it's true to the character, you know. There's no, don't tell me to walk over and pick up a pencil because you find that interesting, man. I, I, I need to find what that character <clears throat> believes in, what that character needs to do. I, need, I'm, I don't like the idea of uh, any choreographed or staged or fraudulent uh, um, expression. Yeah, well, well, and I think that's a characteristic of your life that people, well, that I've come to realize, and we'll talk about it later, is this, is this need for truth, and I, I admire it tremendously, and, and, and I think it's one of the reasons why you're so powerful and, and, one, and so remarkable in what you do. But, uh, and you should applaud at that, by the way. <laughs> but, um, oh, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, Very kind, the, thank you. Anyway, but, but this, this idea of this relationship between creativity and madness, which we're sort of talking about and skirting around, goes back a long way in terms of theater and artists, and, and uh, it, it, in fact, Dionysus, so I know, I know uh, you are fond of because he's the god of wine. And I also discovered the god of hallucinogenic mushrooms. And I didn't know that. Who knew? I didn't know. If, yeah. <laughs> but he was also insane. And he was, he, he sort of characteristic. He was, he was the, the, both of those things. But he, even in Socrates, Socrates said, madness 
provided it comes as the gift of heaven, is the channel by which we receive the greatest blessings. Yeah. You want to comment on that? I think, you know, <clears throat> I think the beauty of those quotes is that um, if you're aware of your, we'll call it madness, um, if you're aware of it, your madness or your insanity, it can be quite painful. Um, if you're not aware of it, what a gas. <laughs> what a gas. So I wish I hadn't been aware of it. Because <laughs> I'd probably just be doing Snoopy dances at this moment. You know? <laughs> um, and I think what those... <laughs> I, I believe what that comes down... For me, how I interpret it is I knew at a certain point I needed to accept that everything that hap had happened to me in my life, every experience, bad, good, whatever, difficult, uh, emotional, I, I knew that that needed to be accepted to incorporate it into my life because otherwise I would be in the bug house to keep one foot in that circle. One foot in the circle. And one foot you think outside it's the circle. There's a question, I mean, for a long time, in, in fact, it was quite, quite uh, accepted or a romantic idea that you had to be mad. And, and in fact, it, that also goes back to classical times. It, it, it goes back to, to uh, uh, Lord Byron as well, but well before that, I think, in fact, Socrates said, if, if a man comes to the door of poetry untouched by the madness of the muses, believing that technique alone will make him a good poet, he and his sane compositions never reach perfection, but are utterly eclipsed by the performances of the inspired madman. You know, that's one of those things, if, I, if you could have written that, you'd just drop the mic and walk away, right? <laughs> it's over. Then, you, you know, Peter, somebody asks you, what do you, what do, you do? Nothing. <laughs> Why? Because I wrote that. This, this, I, I, but you know, I think it, but we, but it's, we shouldn't, I, I think it's unfair to suggest, it, as, and I know we've talked about it, it's one foot in, not both feet in, and it's, and it's it, not well, necessary it's, to be mad. I think that's the point. It, there's this romantic notion that, that there is a romantic notion yeah. about it, and it's, and just like ambition or the term, the term rebel. <laughs> yeah. Which they always try to stick you with when you first come out. Oh, he's a rebel. What does that even mean anymore? Um, but, but if you've got some... If you have the inability to shut down that circus, and when silence becomes the loudest thing you ever hear, there's a cacophony of silence in your head, which means it's non-stop noise visitation <laughs> let's say from um, from your past from your future from your present from your uh, you can't escape it and i i think that, that 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 that's the key if you have it you have it if you don't have it great but don't romanticize it and and, 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 and present yourself as but, something. But use it and yeah. deal with it and, and find it. a way to make it, find a make, make it part it. of your life in a productive way. It's your way. truth. And the truth is it's just like we were talking about. My, my early, the, the, when I was a little kid on public service television or whatever, uh, public broad, broadcasting, you know, PBS, when I was a little kid, every Saturday night, they'd have a... Uh, uh, that have horror films, you know, the Hammer horror films, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, uh, and they would show silent films. And I, I got to learn, at a, I got to watch and, and learn from uh, uh, great silent film actors such as Lon Chaney Sr., who was known as the Man of a Thousand Faces, uh, a character actor, uh, Charlie Chaplin, but most of all Buster Keaton for me, because 
it was so subtle and he didn't push it. But what I realized what, is that those, those actors had, they did not have the luxury of words. Mm -hmm. It's easy to say I love you. But if it's not behind the eyes, if it's not in there, if it's not your truth uh, that you've applied from whatever you got, um, then, it's, then it's bullshit and uh, the audience will see it. Mm. Yeah. Now, thank you. But you know, it's interesting. I know you like the silent actors, but I think you said silence is death, and 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 yeah. and it's, silence is very difficult for you for a variety of reasons. I don't know what you mm. want to talk about, but we can. Yeah. It's, well, silence. You know, I, I, I played music for for a billion years. I started playing music at the age of twelve. I started playing clubs at the age of thirteen. You know, they would sneak me in the back door. I'd play a set. I'd go out the back door. I'd wait for the next set sneak back in, play a set. So that was my early, early life, and I did that until I was about 20 or so. So, loud music is what I wanted because it was the absolute killer of silence. However, tinnitus then comes into the picture. <laughs> and so you develop this ringing in your ears. Uh, and, and, and a ringing in your ear is all right if it's one note. Let's say it's an A. You have an A, the key of A is right here. If you have B flat <laughs> here, there's a dissonance. And uh, it's a very noticeable dissonance and it's a disturbing dissonance and it oscillates. And even without the circus, that alone, um, I, I could, could, could send me to the bug house. Easy. And um, you, when you, and you, when you, something that also surprised me. And we may talk about the music you listen to, but you act, you listen to music when you're acting. When you you listen to music. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Because because I think we we all go through life with some species of soundtrack in our heads. You know. Um, some song gets stuck in your head, and it means something to you. Uh, and I, th I believe that music, for me, um, music is the close, it's the fastest, most efficient way to uh, memory, old memories that, that you apply to the work. And if I have that music in my head, um, I can stay there. Um, as opposed to, you know, you're exposed to, you know, people working, doing things, yeah. and this and that. I'm able to stay in my own world, you know, um, and keep my, keep my work going, you know. The, someone wants to applaud, okay, but... Um, <laughs> The, um, yeah, but it's true. I think it's true okay, for all we're, we're, of us, you know. I, wanna, uh, uh, music I, I is think the, it's interesting. It's the fastest way to an emotion. Yeah, and well, yeah. I, I want to. I know that I, I know we were talking about one song, and I think I have a clip from that later, so we'll get there. We'll get there. By the way, we're going to go a little long. It's clear to me, but I don't really care. Okay, um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> when in terms of, of creativity, madness, I want to talk about life experiences. And when one talks about madness and your life experience, I think we cannot not talk about Hunter Thompson. Oh. And and um, yes, talk about yeah, yeah. yeah. He, de he he deserves you. Thank you. He talk about you. Let, talk, let's talk about it. talk about your relationship to Hunter and and the things. It, it, well, in some ways, as a mentor, but a friend, and 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 how he affected your thoughts about things. Hunter was a lot of things to me, and um, we when, when I met him, it was at the Woody Creek Tavern. <laughs> and, uh, I, which I've been to. Yeah. yeah. I took Stephen Hawking there once, actually. Yeah, I did. But anyway, that's the difference. Anyway. Man. <laughs> wow. <laughs> to have been a fly on the wall. <laughs> but also, how I wish Hunter had been there. <laughs> Me too. Me too, actually. I, I met Hunter uh, through a friend, a mutual friend. Uh, I was at the Woody Creek Tavern. 
as far back in the back as I could get to uh, avoid the novelty uh, syndrome. And uh, next thing I know, the front door bursts open. He's kicked it open. And uh, I see nothing but kind of electricity. <laughs> because in his right hand, he had a uh, cattle prod. <laughs> it's about yay big. And uh, he's swinging that around. And in his left, he had a stun gun. <laughs> and threatening. On the... So when a man walks in with that much power and screaming, get out of my way. Out of my way, you bastards. Um, he, found, he found his way to, the, to my uh, table, walked up, introduced us, took his hand out. We shook hands. He introduced himself. Hi, I'm Hunter. I said, yeah, Johnny, hey. You know. Immediately we started talking about, we're both from Kentucky. He was from Louisville. And uh, I don't know, it, it, it clicked. So he invited me to his house that night and we were spending time together and uh, I noticed there was a beautiful nickel-plated shotgun, uh, Smith, you know, 12 gauge. And uh, I said, well, that's a, that's a beautiful uh, 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 shotgun. He says, oh yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, you wanna, wanna fire it? <laughs> <laughs> it's about 2.33 in the morning. <laughs> So of course I wanted to fire it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, so then he uh, arrived into his kitchen, which was what he called his, you know, sort of command post. Um, and he handed me a propane tank. <laughs> I had a cigarette hanging out of my mouth. So he, I've got the propane tank, and then he hands me a, a small box about, yay big, looked like a box of matches or something. I didn't know what it was, so he says, yeah, tape this to the side. So I'm taping it to the side. I did a couple of them, and I said, what is the, what are these little boxes? He said, oh, that's nitroglycerin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the cigarette went into the sink, and uh, we took him outside. He handed me the shotgun, and it was almost like I felt like it was being, um, like it was a test, in a way. So I aimed at the deal. It was about, I don't know, 30 yards away. I hit the target, the nitroglycerin. The explosion was an 80-foot fireball. <laughs> <laughs> straight into the air, and, uh, which included shrapnel. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was it. That's where we... That's where, that's where you bonded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you it. bond over more than that. I mean, I mean, Hunter was crazy, but he was, he was a remarkable writer and, you, and also a reader, and you guys used to read together. You used to, uh, read, didn't you read we to did. each other or something? We, he, yeah, what Hunter would do is... Uh, we, we can, one of the... One of the things that he, f he found most fascinating was that I was not only aware of a writer called Nathaniel West, but I'd read the four books, only four books, Nathaniel West, Dead of Locusts, uh, The Dream Life of Balsos, I mean, you know, a wonderful writer. And uh, he was shocked that I knew, who the, knew Nathaniel West's uh, work. So we would read, for, or he would, he, would, he would read a bit and then he would have me read. And uh, then we started reading his works, um, things he was working on at the time. And what he would do to me is, uh, he, he, um, he became a conductor, you know? <laughs> I would read, you know, uh, from whatever the work was, you know, uh, and he, what he, he would, he would, you know, I'd read, and he'd go, yes, that's good, that's good, that's good, down, slow down, <laughs> back up, okay, now hit it there, wait a <laughs> yeah, okay, now. <laughs> and so basically, he, Hunter taught me how he wanted his work read, and uh, which is a, I mean, if there's anything such as a blessing, that was it. But then you learned, as a result, you sort of got to, well, I mean, you had the opportunity to play him in front of him, in a sense. Yeah. And then you got to play him on the screen. 
Yes. And I, and I got I to gotta show a clip from, from this, okay. okay? Okay, so from Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. So <laughs> let's, let's... Um, even if I didn't or hadn't known Hunter at the time that we did that film, the 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 pleasure, the 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 the, the it was succulent to be able to say those words, <laughs> um, drop to the floor and scream. No, we haven't done anything yet. <laughs> um, and you would. There are so many beautiful, you know, it's his masterpiece. And, and, and uh, he, was, he was aware of, of that. But he, and, and one can't help but notice that there were some drugs involved in that particular. Yes. Um, and there were drugs involved in, 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 his, in, his, in his life in all ways, I guess, and, and drugs and alcohol. You could say that. Yeah. <laughs> and... And there, there, ha there were drugs and alcohol involved in, in your life when you were younger too, and yeah. and and um, and, it, and the need again. What, can one talk about the need? I mean, acting is an escape, but so are. In fact, one of the things that in our in our meeting that we we're having here, one of the one of the people in the early early on talked about that that ke single chemicals and and you can scan the brain create new patterns that you've never experienced before, talking about pattern recognition as part of consciousness, and that drugs, can, single chemicals, can produce new patterns you've never experienced before. And is, is, is it that, is that sort of uh, something one is driven to, once again, because reality is sometimes intolerable? Yeah. Yeah? I would say. <laughs> I mean, so you, weren't, you didn't do drugs when you were younger to party? Never. I mean, I, you know, like we all grew up, you know, uh, the parties uh, when you were a kid in school. I mean, I, I, I didn't take part in any of that because it was the drugs that I, I started very early, you know, maybe 12, you know, stealing uh, what was called back then nerve pills <laughs> from, uh, from my mom's purse. <laughs> And uh, never did I take a drug, never did I take a drink, never did I do any of that to, for that, you know, the term which I despise, let's party. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I was self-medicating. I was, I was trying to numb myself. I was trying to calm the circus. I was trying to calm the brain. I was trying to feel better than I did. And um, so I believe myself. There's a very important quote that people uh, it's not that people take for granted, but it, it, it's, it's, it's not noticed enough for people to really understand Hunter Thompson, um, who, we, Hunter did exactly the same as myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, 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 we talked about it extensively. Um, Hunter was never one of those guys that, yes, let's get, no. He never, I never heard him say the word party or anything like that. <laughs> It was a necessity, it was self-medicating. And there's a quote at the beginning of Fear and Loathing um, that says, he who makes a beast of himself gets rid of the pain of being a man. And that quote, a lot of people don't realize it, that quote is Hunter, you know? That quote is Hunter, because he had to get rid of the pain of being a man. He, had, he was played as a lot of us are plagued. Mm -hmm. um, what Hunter had, two things that people didn't know about Hunter, they thought he was just a savage, um, <clears throat> and he could be. 
But he was, he was an extreme gentleman. He was a southern gentleman. And aside from that, he was a hyper, hyper, hypersensitive human being who had no way of releasing the demons that would never, you know, and, and never come back. Um, so, hunters, again, talk about truth. Yeah. I, I lived with Hunter. I, I lived, I lived three months. I, he, he made a bedroom for me in his basement. And I lived there for about three months on and off. Uh, and my, my nightstand was, a, it was a, this beautiful keg. Um, <laughs> and that's where I kept my ashtray and whatnot. And, uh, then I realized it was an actual live uh, keg of gun, gunpowder. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> when I realized what it was, you know, the brown recluse that I was living with in that room, <laughs> that, 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 that was nothing. Uh, so I ran to Hunter upstairs and I said, come here, you got to come here, you got to come here. And I showed him the nightstand, keg of gunpowder, and he said, oh, Jesus, that's where that went. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's other Hunter stories about his hypersensitivity. Maybe we'll get to them in the question period. But, but, uh, but the, I want to relate this, the, the drug aspect, to something that's interesting. That w When we've talked about our own lives, which have had especially our young periods for which there was stress, we had a really interesting talk today by, by someone who I think I see in the audience, perhaps, but, um, at our meeting, um, that showed something really interesting, which is that stress affects brain development when you're young. And that, yeah, sure. of course, and it's really fascinating because in, in many different ways, but in particular, it, it seems clear to that if you, and I went up and asked her this afterwards because I was thinking about talking to you about this, yeah. that if, if you are exposed to a lot of stress, that your brain develops ways to respond to it, so the stress hormones, and that some people may therefore only function efficiently if they're under stress, if they're used to being stressful as a child. And I think, I think we both share that. I mean, both our mothers are alive, and we, we apologize to both of you out there if you're watching. And, but it was and, pretty, and but it was pretty stressful. We probably have to thank them as well. <laughs> what was that? We probably have to thank them yeah, as well. Yeah, we'll have to thank them as well, exactly. No, that's true. But, but do you think that you, that, 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 do you agree that that sort of uh, affects the, the way... You, I think it's everything. I think it's... I think... I believe it's exactly the reason I ended up what I am. I think it's... You know, listen, uh, childhood is an interesting thing. But when you live what is called childhood, and it's not a childhood necessarily, mm -hmm. um, no sense of security, no, no real, and we moved constantly. I, when I was a kid, we moved like gypsies, man, you know. One time we moved from one house to the house next door. <laughs> it's true. Uh, so we moved around a lot, and I, I never had that sense of home or security or whatever. So, the, and, 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 you know, it was, it was a, you know, a somewhat violent uh, up, upbringing. Um, so that stress that, that begins actually at, at, at a very young age because, I mean, it's, I think the, the, it's been the, the fact has been proven that we are exactly who we're going to be at the age of three. And, you know, raising my kids, uh, my, my, my daughter is now 16, about to be 17, my boy's 13, about to be 14. They are exactly who they were then. Um, and they've lived a, a life. I mean, when I had kids, the first decision I made was, I will raise them. I will do everything in the opposite. Yeah, my mother's been very useful to me raised. for that reason too, yeah. <laughs> you know, so my kids have turned out semi-normal. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, 
you just at a certain point, you must accept it. You know, you yeah, you know, and, and I was there's something it. I was going to talk about later, but I, I've seen you with your kids, and, and you're a wonderful father. But, Thank you. But uh, um, one of the things that you said... It's the, we're, it's, we're it's, doing a, it's, the, it's the only thing that I aspire <laughs> to be good at. You know? but we're doing a bunch of things together, and, 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 and some I can talk about, some I can't, but we're going to do um, the, the Reason Rally together in, in, in June and in Washington, D.C. And... Um, and uh, be fun. And 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 you said you said to me once, and I, I was going to have to talk about it much later, but it's appropriate now because I think it's important when you talked about the reason you want to do the reason rally because you said you want truth at whatever the cost. Yes. And I think when when I when we talked about why we're doing the reason rally, one of the reasons you said related to your children. To go to the reason rally and speak uh, and to express your truth which is all important, it's everything. Why do we have to skirt around lies? Why do we have to figure it out? Or at an early age, because you observe people to the degree that it's like ill, um, and you see the lie coming around the corner. I, I can't and no one should accept anything but the truth. Yeah, I think the truth, I mean, because to have to suffer the ignorance of someone lying to you for some type of gain and I don't know what, but I, I, I only know that, you know, when Lawrence and I talked about doing the Reason Rally, um, my only reason to be involved was I love my kids, you know. Yeah. I care about my children, and uh, as we all do, and they deserve a different world. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's all you need to say. That's all you need to say. And I can't think of a better reason. Look, I, I went over. I, I got to show this clip because I, because I just love your performance in it. So to, I'm trying to think of a reason to show What's it. What's going to happen? And now? um. Uh, but no, no, but, but going back, so one of the reasons you're a good father is because you wanted to not have the upbringing you had. And we talked about you and Hunter and the, the being driven to drugs and, and, and it, or alcohol or whatever. Um, as, and both of you managed in some ways, him maybe more destructively, I don't know, to channel it into creativity. Well, yeah. Again, to go back to this character that I know you felt close to, yes. in different ways, the Libertine character. Yeah. We saw the need for him to do the theater, but now we can see the other side of him, and I wanted to show this clip, which okay. I think is really powerful. Cool. Okay. Good luck. Action. <laughs> that was a, that's a very powerful scene. Thank you. It's a very powerful scene, but you can't help but get the sense that that's that you could that you relate to that character in some way. That, that that the intensity, the need, the drive for that sort of thing, and uh, and so you know he was an interesting character because he was creative. He was a writer and a, and a, and, a, and he was a great poet. You know, uh, John Wilmot, the Earl of Rochester. He was a great, great poet. And um, oh, good. <laughs> And he is, if he's thought of at all uh, with regard to history, he's thought of as, you know, this, a member of the court of King Charles II as a, a, a satire, a, a, a writer of somewhat unimportant little, you know, uh, 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 and clever little insults. And he was allowed to get away with it. But the man was a poet of, of, of monumental importance. And so my, in, my intention in playing Wilmot, because I loved him, um, was to bring his truth to the people. And I knew at the time, you know, there's a, you make certain choices in terms of your, the films you make, 
it's none of my business if a film is successful. Mm -hmm. You know? I, I can't think about box office or any of this. I don't care. I really don't care. <laughs> because... <laughs> it's just not... That's not part of my job, you know? That's someone else's thing, and I got plenty to carry. <laughs> so I don't, I, I just don't care. You know? when, when, when you said bring him to his truth, you were telling me that there was, there was oh, the some, moment. Yeah, a yeah. moment, yeah. Why don't you talk about that? You know, it was, a, it was a moment when it actually happened because I couldn't, that I'm pretty good at memorizing dialogue. And I'm pretty good at taking the man's words and, and, and bringing a truth to them, bringing an honesty to them that, 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 unfortunately, you have to draw from within. And I knew that the film was going to be painful to make because I was going to have to travel, travel in a sense of pull things from my past. And I don't like doing that because it hurts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It hurts, man. So but I knew that the man was worthy of it. And I was trying to memorize this one particular speech. It was a five-page speech, and I just couldn't get it. And I knew something was wrong, so I went back into his works, and I realized that what they had done, the writer had done, was he took a section of this particular writing, he took a section of this particular writing, this particular, and he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he piecemealed them together. And it just didn't work for me. And I, f I almost felt like, uh, and I'm not like Mooney or New Age or, you know, ghost. <laughs> but I, 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 I felt that the man was telling me, don't fuck with my work. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. So what I did was I just took those pieces, took out the others, and, and made his speech that he'd written. And instantly it was, I could memorize it because it flowed, because it was his, because it was written because he cared about it, and you can't, it's like the, the melange or some sort of, you know, taking three songs and mixing them together, yeah. it just doesn't happen. Wait, you, you talked about, by the way, I, I, I wanna get, go, we're gonna go about 15 more minutes, so hold your bladders, okay, and then we'll take a break. But, um, I, st I, uh, I stutter, that's why I talk. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, no. I and stammer, you too. I stutter. But, <laughs> but uh, um, that you talked how difficult it was, and, and I've always wondered well, about how di you, know, you have to dredge up these experiences like left, right, and center to play, and how it affects you in your life, and how you can do that. And so that was painful, but you had another experience with a person who was also kind of a little odd, uh, and Marlon Brando, and, and, and who was a, yeah. A, a, really? And that's less painful, because Marlon, I know you love Marlon, and, and you I worship him, him, yeah. And I still do. Um, and I'm still very close with the family. And Marlon became, again, like Hunter, although he didn't make me shoot a <laughs> nitroglycerin propane tank. But Marlon, Marlon and I met over the phone because I wanted to do Don Juan DeMarco with him. And um, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, so we met over the phone. We spoke for three hours on the telephone. I was in New York, he was in Los Angeles. I went back the next week, he invited me for dinner. We sat and we talked, and it was, we, we, we connected on many levels, uh, especially the fact that no one wants to be a novelty. <laughs> um, but one of the things that happened was we, I asked him about, a, there was a quote by William Soroyan that it's the, pre basically it's a word, quote, it's a preface of uh, In the Time of Your Life, the play, which the play, I, 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 
Don't read the play. <laughs> read the preface. It, it's something that had touched me in a, in a large way, like a philosophical, like a w the way to live your life, a real roadmap as to live your life. And so I asked him about it, and he said, yeah, he knew, you know. And uh, so he said, how well do you know it? And I, so I began to recite it, because I, at that time I had uh, memorized it. And uh, so I began to recite this preface in the time of your life. And uh, I got to a certain point, and he finished it. Oh. oh. Verbatim. And I was somewhat stupefied. I said, that's incredible. I've, and I pulled out my wallet, and I said, I've carried this, this dog-eared thing that I had ripped out of a book. I've carried this for years in my wallet. And he said, hang on a second. <laughs> but he, and he, he got up, uh -huh. and he grabbed a frame that was just by his bed, and he came to me, and he showed it to me. And he had a very similar dog-eared, uh, folded, uh, well, well used uh, version of the, it. Was the, it was the same thing that he had carried in his wallet for all those years. So there was this. He understood me very well instantly, and I understood him, and I was very lucky to become so close with the man. You know. But he um, he he said to you. Well, he asked about how many films you did. I, and in terms yeah. of thinking about characters. And, yeah, and, that was that was that, that that was quite a moment because that's one of those things that's seared onto your brain forever. You know, and you know that the, the, the moments before you become smoke, um, it'll come to you. He asked me, uh, how many films, uh, John? <laughs> you... He either called me John or Johan. It was very rarely <laughs> Johnny. And he, he said, how many films do you uh, average per year that you do? And I said, I don't know, maybe two or three. He said, no, that, that's too much. <laughs> so I said, well, why is that too much, man? He said, because we only have so many faces in our pockets. <laughs> <laughs> we only have so many faces in our pocket. You've had a lot of faces. And, and I want to spend the last few minutes going through some of the faces. I still, and I still my, 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 unfortunately, because of my madness, uh -huh. uh, I feel like there's still a lot of faces in my pockets. Yeah. <laughs> speaking, speaking. I do. Speaking of a lot of faces in your pocket, there's also in your head. There's a line in 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 uh, that the Mad Hatter says in Alice mm -hmm. about. Um, I, you probably remember it better than me. <laughs> it was a, there, there's a moment in. Um, Alice in Wonderland, the first uh, one with Tim, the one that Tim directed, Tim Burden. Uh, I was chained to a floor by the Red Queen uh, to make her hats. She wanted hats. So um, Alice comes to rescue me. And she says, let's go, let's go, Hatter. We have to go. And I refused, uh, or the hatter refused, and uh, at a certain point she grabs me and l looks into my eyes, and the first thing that came into my mind was, I, I, I believe I pointed to my head, and I said, I don't like it in here, it's too crowded. <laughs> and uh, it was one of those things that just happened. It, was, it wasn't in the script, you know. It's, it's, uh, but it, there was there, 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 there was a lot of truth in it. Well, S and I and I thought it applied to that character. It applied that character. It seemed to apply to a bunch of other characters. And I and 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 I wanna I wanna show some clips from that seem to be reoccurring in some of the movies. One sure. one from Secret Window and another from the Pirates. So let's 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 watch that.
So, the, 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 so, the, 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 the peanut, incidentally, the pe I have to say the peanut, <laughs> became like my favorite thing, the idea of that. All these various sides of Jack were obsessed with the peanut. <laughs> And one of my favorite lines that, that, uh, that you know, happened uh, in that was, my peanut. Because <laughs> I love the idea that something so huge is going on, but at the very center of it is this insignificant <laughs> little nothing that becomes everything. Well, it, 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 uh, Jack Sparrow, we, we talked about why you made Jack Sparrow the way he did, but, but, this, but I was surprised to see in so many movies the fact that you, talk, you see different versions of yourself. And when you talk about the faces and one talks about the impact the characters play on you, does, does it ever happen to you in real life that you look around and see lots of versions of yourself? Does it ever happen? In, 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 in terms... I do. Like if you I looked out at right the now. audience, for example, would you, would you, you know, would, if you looked out, say, at the audience, would you see... Lots of versions of yourself. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. Now I know. <laughs> now I know for sure that I'm actually lying in a hospital bed. <laughs> in a coma. <laughs> I've probably been in this coma for about 23 years. And uh, none of this is happening. I, wa I, wa I want you to know they're all hand-colored. Everyone spent the time beforehand coloring these in. Is that true? Well, you guys, you guys are mad. Yeah, there you go. This is madness. That's in any case, um, That's look, amazing. Too many faces. <laughs> <laughs> so much for the, the impact the characters have had in you. I want to just close by talking about the various characters and, and sort of how you draw from them. And Because and, uh, and, and, we, are, we are going late, and I want to end now in a few minutes, but um, well, I'm let scared. me just ask you about these characters. So, oh, in fact, you said before, I want to mention Edward Scissorhands, because that was the first character that liberated you from, from, from and, and what, what did you draw from to, to, to do Edward Scissorhands? I, rem I remember reading the, the screenplay to Edward Scissorhands for the first time, and I was up in Vancouver, and I was doing that TV show, and I was absolute, I read the screenplay, and I was devastated by it. Because it represented exactly how I felt growing up. Like I said, not necessarily outside, but for sure not inside. I didn't want to choose any side. I just wanted to be. And Edward, when I read the screenplay, I found myself at the end of the thing. Like, you know, I, I hate to say it, but... <clears throat> Yeah, crying, you know, uh, sobbing when I read that screenplay. And I knew that I would never be chosen as Edward Scissorhands to play that part, even though I knew it was me. Um, because everybody in, in Hollywood was gagging for it, you know. Tom Cruise was talked about. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, I think they should do a remake. <laughs> with Tom Cruise. <laughs> Why not? Um, but, but what I drew upon with regard to Edward was um, I had a dog, you know, once, and uh, it was the most loving, caring, had the kindest eyes I, I, I think I've ever seen. Um, dog does something bad, whatever, you, you scold it, it goes to the corner. The second you call it back, it's there. Unconditional love, innocence. Um, so that dog became the part of the foundation of the character. So the character really was based on a dog that I had, and I know, right? <laughs> That's madness. <laughs> it's not creativity. Um, and, and babies, you know, newborn babies, because uh, 
this 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 character was was the challenge was to see things for the first time anew anew and as to be fascinated with them so I, <laughs> that's not part of me that's a, <laughs> so I, I, you know there was there was, I was trying to figure out a way to really get to the place where I could understand what that might feel like, you know, the newness or the fascination of things that are most mundane. Um, so, what I did was uh, I dropped two hits of ecstasy. <laughs> I don't think I've ever told this story before. <laughs> Uh, I was living, uh, at the time I'd rented a house in Malibu to escape from Hollywood, and I was living right on the beach. So the first thing I did was made a big note, taped it to the glass window that would take me to the beach and my death. Uh, and I wrote on it, do not go into the ocean. <laughs> just in case I forgot. <laughs> and I dropped two hits of ecstasy, and I strapped the hands on, and, uh, you know, attempted to make coffee uh, with these enormous scissors on. Uh, attempted to, 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 to uh, you know, run the remote control of the television. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, and, and then, of course, at a certain point, when the when the uh, the, the the drug kicks in, really kicks in, um, things become vivid, or became vivid and beautiful, and and I could see things anew, and I could appreciate where they came from, because I. I think, I think of Edward as, that, as, as those babies, you know, when my sister had kids and I'd hang out with these babies, the, 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 everything was fascinating. Yeah, no, and you, you, didn't you read and a book? And I found great safety. Well, did, didn't you read a book, was it by Oliver Sacks or something at the time? It, uh, there, was a, there was a book that I'd read at the time by Oliver Sacks called uh, The Man Who Miss... Hey! Well, I've been cut off, that's it. You've been cut off? The drugs, no. Can you hear, can, you, can we get a mic? Because this is neat. Oh, is it working now? Okay, working. It's working. So, the man... Play music some other time. More, more code. It's working, isn't it? Okay, cool. How are we doing? You are very kind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Speak softly and carry one. <laughs> Speak softly. Um, the man who missed... Uh, Oliver that? Sacks was... was oh. So yeah, uh, uh, there was an Oliver Sacks book called um, "The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat." It's a, it's a great book. It's a, it's a great there. book. And um, I thought of this. I found these incidences very beautiful. The guy who was literally attempting to pull his wife's head off in in the office, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, as he was leaving because. He was going to put it on his head <laughs> as a hat, and and, the, and and then it goes on and on. It's a wonderful book. I also read a book by uh, Bruno Bettelheim that was uh, about uh, uh, essentially uh, fairy tales and uh, the importance of fairy tales. Is this gone too? No, no, it's oh. it's there. Um, so the importance of fairy tales and. That was very helpful also. There was also a, 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 a German uh, 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 thing uh, John Waters gave me called De Stumpelpeter. <laughs> and it was a kid who refused to cut his nails and, you know, comb his hair and, well, it's, you know, this, this sort of fight against normalcy and what people wanted. Um, so those things were very, very, very. It's, it was, and well, it was such. I, I wanted to spend time. It was such an important role for you because that that set you on a different trajectory. Let's do quickly some others. Just you know, one or two words. Willy Wonka. 
Who, who did you, yeah, what, what, who was that? Thank you, thank you. When I was approaching the character of uh, Willy Wonka, I, you know, we all grew up with the Gene Wilder version and it's, and it's fantastic. I mean, it's, yeah. 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 It's fantastic. But you know, I mean, why go in that direction? It's been done. Why repeat? Why? So I found my own version, and my version was, I kept thinking of children's television hosts. <laughs> that scared me. <laughs> because, yeah, well, you, they were unpredictable, you know, and, and, and they had that very, everything was okay. <laughs> and, and it wasn't okay. But so, so, so I, I use these children's television host sort of ideas. And then the other ingredient that I thought was, was really what found the character, I thought of George W. Bush. <laughs> if he were incredibly stoned. <laughs> <laughs> But like not just uncomfortably stoned. <laughs> it passed what could have been the uncomfortable paranoia stage. <laughs> where he just sort of doesn't know what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Matt Hatter. Who is your how did, Matt Hatter? Um, the, the 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 Matt Hatter was basically. Um, uh, a kind of a, yeah. My kid, this is real weird. So my kids had a tutor. And we were on the road, you know, I'm working and stuff like that. So they had this tutor. Her name was Catherine. And she was one of those English people, very proper. But Catherine would talk to you. She had a little bit of a thing in her voice and so I sponged her up as much as I could <laughs> because what I loved about her was she would she would sort of talk to you like this you know and really it's one of those people who like you know it's not that they avert their eyes they actually close their eyes when they're looking at you <laughs> right you guys have felt that before it's weird <laughs> so, so I used Catherine because when she closed her eyes and she's looking at you, I mean, every day was very, very important. <laughs> I, I had to see that. I had to see that. I love it. I love it. That poor thing, she, she, she'll find this out tomorrow and probably there'll be a lawsuit. Um, <laughs> okay, two more quickly. Um, Ed Woods. Ed Wood, um, thank, oh, thank you. Yeah, it, that was one of those moments where it's, you know, what are you doing, Johnny? Well, I'm, 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 I'm doing a film with Tim. What is it about? It's about a, someone who is called the worst film director of all time, <laughs> uh, who happened to be a transvestite. <laughs> and... Uh, and we're doing it in black and white. Ed Wood was born really in my, what, what the ingredients that went into my head were uh, the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. That sort of, you know, uh, attack, v verbal, vocal attack of Casey Kasem, where everything was just sort of that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then the blind optimism of Ronald Reagan, you know, uh, yes, well, every, mommy, you know, um, so the, when they came together, those ingredients, it kind of became that guy. <laughs> Where everything was fine. <laughs> okay, you know, um, okay. That's I, the problem, see the, that's the problem, I think, in terms of uh, what could be considered madness is if you think of yourself, or I, as I must, as a chest of drawers, 
they're all in there. <laughs> and they're all accessible. I'm not sure that's healthy. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know. Well, let's, let's take the craziest one of all you just added to the chest. Um, Donald Trump. <laughs> Uh, he was difficult <laughs> because how do you approach that? You know? how, do you, how do you approach that? Um, I approach Donald Trump as a... Uh, and it's not just about being a rich kid or anything like that. I approach Donald Trump as what you kind of see in him when you really watch him. There's a pretense, there's, a, there's something created about him in a sense of bullydom. But what he is, I believe, is a brat. <laughs> He's a brat. I want the Taj Mahal. I want the Taj Mahal. I want the Taj Mahal. Brat. Okay, look. And also, <laughs> also, the absurdity of where his sentences might travel. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, I mean, really, no, I mean, so, no, no, because everything is mine. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I don't own it yet, I'll have it. You've got Reagan who, <laughs> this kills me. Reagan, back in the day, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. <laughs> Donald Trump, <laughs> I'm going to build a wall. <laughs> there, no, Mexico, okay, no, no, a, a fabulous wall. <laughs> sensational, sensational wall. <laughs> and all of my billions, are not going to have to pay for it. No, really, no. Because you know why? Mexico's going to pay for it. <laughs> Brilliant, <laughs> Donald. <laughs> it had to let that happen. It had to let that happen. It had to be that. Okay. Look, I, I want to say, I mean, if it isn't obvious, regarding creativity, you may be mad, but you're very creative. And, and in the workshop that we just had, um, there's an, there's an interesting, another discussion about connectivity in the brain and can relationship between connectivity and, 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 and creativity. And one of the people in the workshop asked if, um, if we could image your brain. Is that okay? <laughs> no, I'd actually love that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's sort of... It's sort of be good to know what's going on, actually. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, go, it, go, it falls back into that, you know, truth at all costs. You know? <laughs> I don't mind what comes out. I, I, because I can't change it. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah I'm in. Okay, great. Uh, you heard it. You heard it here. Look, I, I know we've gone, we've gone over, in case you hadn't noticed, but... I can't, ever, there's, not a, there's not a day I that I have spent with you when I, I just didn't want to have more. And, 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 and I say this, I feel remarkably lucky that you're in my life. But, 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 uh, <laughs> but I, had, I, I wasn't going to say that, but what I really want to say is, and I think everyone in this audience is, we are remarkably lucky in the world that you are here, and it would be much less interesting if you weren't. So thank you. questions if you're still can put up we'll, we'll, we'll do a half an hour of questions we'll take you know maybe 15 minute break and then and then pass down your questions we'll take some and we have a surprise uh, so stick around thank you very much <laughs>